excited to welcome uh, Hannah Raza. She is joining us today from Iraqi Kurdistan. She is a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, the CAT Specialist Group, and the Sustainable Youth and Livelihood Specialist Group. She's also a member of the Ornithological Society of the Middle East, uh, Conservation Fund Committee, and was a 2017 Future for Nature Award laureate. So let's bring her in here now. Hi, Hannah, how are you? Hello, Joe, how are you? Good, good, absolutely thrilled to have you joining us. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. Oh, thank you so much, the Global Biodiversity Festival organizers. It's an honor to uh, be part of this um, amazing and inspiring event and congratulations for running it so beautifully. I've been inspired, so thank you. All right, well, we can't wait to dive into your work. I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit and then uh, we'll save a little time for some Q&A action. All right. Am I doing it right? I see it, it's starting to load up. I think you just need to pull the presentation to the front and then go full screen, we'll be good to go. I don't know, sorry, you have to. No, no, don't worry, I'm gonna pop it up so I can see your screen. Oh yeah, if you go down and just click the PowerPoint down at the bottom, the orange. So Perfect. Great. great. So um, today oh, I will sorry. be- And I'm gonna ask just one more thing. If yeah. you click that little hide and that, that should take it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Beautiful. Fun? Great. Yeah, so uh, today I won't be talking about the, the scientific details of our research, uh, but uh, I want to present an overview uh, of the amazing biodiversity of Iraq and uh, the turmoils the country uh, and the biodiversity has gone through and what has been done to try and protect these remaining uh, intact habitats and uh, what needs to be done uh, to increase the chances of biodiversity protection in Iraq. So uh, my name is Hannah Rosa. I am Kurdish. Um, just to let, uh, tell you a little bit about my background because there's confusion uh, between the Kurds and Iraq uh, or Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, the Kurds are known as the world's largest stateless nation, uh, denied their own state when the, the powers drew uh, the Middle East uh, border in 1925 and divided it over four countries in Turkey, uh, Syria, Iran, and Iraq. I was born and raised in the Iraqi part of Kurdistan, also known as uh, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, I became a wildlife conservationist uh, because growing up and living in a region uh, of the world, um, you know, where instability and, and war have been the immediate reality of always uh, felt that the bigger picture has been lost on the nation. Uh, that you know, species conservation and biodiversity conservation is um, as a necessary, um, uh, you know, very important for the future of uh, you know the, the entire planet, let alone this country. Uh, so, right after completing my bachelor degree in biology in 2009, I jumped at the opportunity to join Nature Iraq, uh, back then the country's only conservation organization. I've been working as a wildlife conservationist for 12 years now with the main focus on mammals and more specifically on the uh, protection of a Persian leopard and its prey species and also lobbying for protected area establishment uh, in the country. I'm currently working on two projects with Nature Iraq, uh, the Persian leopard conservation program that started in 2016 and still ongoing and uh, the nature, uh, the Karadag Nature Reserve uh, project uh, that I will be talking about in detail shortly. So this area in focus is our main uh, study area um, in Iraqi Kurdistan, in the north of Iraq. The red dot is um, here is the country of Iraq and on the north of it is where Iraqi Kurdistan is located and it's, it's my favorite uh, place because that's where one of the rarest uh, top predators, the Persian leopard, which is also known as the Caucasian leopard, lives. And it's rich in biodiversity, but also because uh, it's a resilient place with resilient people and, and of course, resilient nature. Since uh, World War I, uh, Iraq had fought over uh, 25 major wars, uh, the ones that involved uh, the Kurds who demanded the right to self-ruling and autonomy 
began in 1943. Uh, since then, many wars were fought, but the most devastating were the Anfal campaign and the famous Halabja chemical attack, uh, which is shown um, in that picture. Uh, that took place during the Iran-Iraq war in 1988, uh, and uh, these wars left millions of landmines along the Iran-Iraq border and destroyed. Uh, 200, um, it, it killed um, over 250,000 people. It displaced more than 70,000 more people and uh, destroyed uh, 4,000 villages in the Kurdistan region. Until in uh, 1991 the Kurds uh, received autonomy from Iraq. So these wars had left a uh, major impact on both the livelihood of the people uh, and nature of the country, um, as you can imagine. So after the Gulf War in the 90s, uh, Saddam Hussein regime drained the marshes uh, in the south of Iraq as well by diverting the flow of two main uh, rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, away from the marshes. And this was an attempt to stop the uh, remaining militias from taking refuge in these areas who were participating in anti-government rebellions. Uh, due to that drainage of the marshes, um, the habitat was degraded uh, severely and the population of many species, uh, including the Lutrigal uh, Perspicillata maxwelli, uh, smooth-coated otter, uh, and uh, was almost driven to extinction. But thankfully, in 2013, with the help of Nature Iraq, the uh, Iraqi government announced the Central Marshes as Iraq's first uh, national park uh, in 2016. It was inscribed in uh, on UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. Now, talking about war, uh, Iraq, you know, the word Iraq probably brings to your minds images of war and landmines and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, to me, however, um, and in my talks, I make sure that I bring people hope when you hear the word Iraq. Um, and, you know, I would like you to think of the snow-capped mountains, uh, majestic valleys, uh, these wild rivers that, um, you know, clean streams are run from the mountains of Kurdistan uh, southward to feed the marshlands. So Iraq has a uh, beautiful nature and a rich biodiversity. Um, over 90 mammal species exist uh, in Iraq, some 20 of which are of conservation concern. Uh, a number of endemic mammal species, uh, for example, the um, vulnerable Maxwelli and the Pans bandicodrat, uh, which is endangered. Um, around 100 reptile species are found in Iraq, uh, including the Safin leaf toad gecko, the globally endangered Japanese softshell turtle that you saw the picture of previously, uh, and the Kurdistan viper. About 10 amphibians, um, for example, the critically endangered uh, Kurdistan newt and the vulnerable Lake Irmi newt, 419 birds, uh, 20 uh, globally threatened, 182 are passage migrants, uh, 27 are vagrant um, you know, to Iraq, and an additional 27 are uh, vagrant species. Over four bird species are either endemic or have endemic races uh, found in Iraq. 79 freshwater fish are also found, six of which are endemic, uh, including the uh, Iraq blind barb, uh, Haditha cave fish, and this newly discovered carp fish that was named after me. I put the picture here. Uh, and over 3,500 plant species, of which 190 are endemic. So as you can probably imagine by now, in Iraq, biodiversity has never seen the attention it deserves until Nature Iraq initiated its long-term plan for nature conservation in 2004. Uh, the key biodiversity areas of Iraq uh, was the result of more than 15 years of research by Nature Iraq and its partners and across 18 out of 19 uh, the governors that make up Iraq. Uh, as a result, we've identified 82 KVA sites that are important for the country's biodiversity, uh, compiling the data into a book called uh, Key Biodiversity Areas of Iraq, Priority Sites for Conservation and Protection, which I added the, the cover of the book here. And uh, it was published in 2017, and it's available on Amazon for anybody who would like to purchase it. The total area of these KVA sites are almost 30,000 square kilometers. Uh, which is only 7% of Iraq's land. Uh, out of these 82 KVAs, uh, on, uh, 75 KVAs are currently unprotected. Uh, and overall, only 6% of Iraq is officially protected. 
and 2% locally protected in Kurdistan, which leaves 92% of its land unprotected. Um, owing to four decades of war and neglect in Iraq, uh, the leopard uh, was thought to have followed the Asiatic lion and the cheetah into local extinction until 10 years ago when our team was able to uh, uh, you know, record the first evidence of the leopard in Iraq. This discovery brought hope and, and rekindled optimism for making a real difference in the conservation front in Iraq. Uh, because that meant that, you know, the leopard will now make a stronger case for nature conservation, which has been neglected for so many years. Uh, the International Union for uh, Conservation of Nature, IUCN, lists uh, the Persian leopard as endangered, estimating that less than uh, 1,300 adults remain. Uh, the, the, their stronghold is in Iran, by the way. The Persian leopard um, is the largest subspecies among the nine subspecies of Pantheopardis. And throughout its range, uh, their, their primary threat is poaching, habitat degradation, and prey depletion. And the local people um, here, you know, uh, degrade the cat's habitat, they uh, deplete the water resources, and they kill them and their prey species with everything they get their hands on, from guns, cars, dogs, um, traps, and poison. And of course, their prey species is facing the same threats, and therefore there's the leopard's source of food is depleting as well. The fact that uh, most of the leopards range here in Kurdistan mountains and um, elsewhere uh, throughout its range uh, in Iran, Turkmenistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Afghanistan, uh, Turkey, and uh, the Caucasus is prone to human volatility uh, means that it can be very difficult to direct um, attention and government policy uh, and funds towards conservation of this species. Uh, and the leopard's elusive uh, nature is a big part of it, what's helped it to survive here. So uh, since the first camera trap uh, image, we've been laying the groundwork for uh, the leopard's conservation, uh, the leopard and its prey. And in fact, we've been using the leopard as an umbrella species to protect the entire biodiversity and other species, other important species uh, and habitats uh, in this region. Uh, first, we documented their habitat through uh, a habitat suitability mapping with occupancy modeling. As I said, I won't get into the detail of how we did that, but uh, this is the uh, result that, um, of the, uh, the proposed uh, pr um, connectivity patches that we are suggesting between, this is the border of Iran and Iraq. Uh, this is our st study area from Iraq side that combines Karadakh, Darbandihan, and Hauraman three areas. Uh, to two already established protected areas from Iran, was in Marahil and Shahuk of Salan. And these are the connectivity patches that we have proposed as part of our study um, with hopes of uh, you know, a, a, a proposed peace park or transboundary area between the two borders. Then uh, I was able to um, estimate the leopard's population, the prey population, the bazaar goat. Um, through um, my, as part of my um, MSc thesis at Newcastle University, uh, with support from the UK government's Chimney Scholarship. Um, and I also worked on the same area where, uh, which is suitable for the Persian leopard. Um, and also advocating for the designation and management of these reserves, which I will talk about shortly. But things went downhill once again in 2014 with the coming of ISIS, the Islamic State. Since then, Iraq um, and Kurdistan have gone through a devastating economic and civil unrest, uh, leading a lot of companies uh, to leave the region and businesses to shut down, and a lot of uh, non-profit organizations like Nature Iraq to suffer from lack of funding. Uh, what makes the matter worse is that many, um, uh, many times Iraq is seen as a land of war uh, and not many international organizations are interested in investing here. Uh, donors are mostly interested um, in funding humanitarian rehabilitation, uh, which is very important. But once again, with these turmoils, biodiversity conservation is uh, left behind and not seen as a priority. So it's been very difficult to locate funds, but we've been um, lucky uh, to you know, still be able to locate funds from ISA Netherlands Land Acquisition Fund and the Future for Nature Foundation. 
which thankfully came during the time that uh, biodiversity in this region uh, needed attention the most. And this image uh, shows um, one of the de devastating impacts uh, of ISIS that, um, you know, um, this is uh, in Mosul when ISIS um, uh, lost and they were taken out of Mosul, they uh, burnt the oil fields in that area. And these children are playing after they returned back to their city after the fall of ISIS. Um, so the land acquisition uh, and the, na the Qardar Nature Reserve uh, that I mentioned uh, provides funding to, um, uh, it, it was um, received through funding from the uh, IC Netherlands Land Acquisition Fund, uh, which funds NGOs to buy or lease land and declare it as reserves. Uh, but for us, this wasn't possible because Qardar was not up for sale or for lease. Um, so we came up with an idea to, um, you know, get the land without these two scenarios. Then, so we signed a memorandum of understanding with the KRG uh, Board of Environment uh, to manage Karadag uh, through developing and implementing a management plan, which will protect uh, the, you know, biodiversity and the habitat of that area. Uh, in general, and um, of course, with the main attention for the protection of the Persian leopards. For that purpose, we built an eco lodge uh, to promote ecotourism in that area uh, and a ranger station uh, to control illegal hunting and poaching um, to give the biodiversity of that area a little bit of time to thrive. Uh, Karadag Mountain is uh, an area of outstanding natural beauty and rich biodiversity. Uh, it's located in the Zagros Mountain Forest Steppe ecoregion, uh, which uh, is a very diverse mountain that runs uh, from Iran uh, through Iraq and um, Syria and Turkey. Um, this is a, a very critically endangered ecoregion as well, and it supports oak dominant and pistachio forest. Um, it's highly diverse um, and uh, it's, it's a very environmentally fragile landscape, uh, which provides essential habitat for the Persian leopard and large, a large number of endemic and uh, endangered flora and fauna species, and many still undiscovered species that are under pressure from the environmental change and human activities. And this diversity is uh, important for maintaining both the global biodiversity and ensuring the longevity of local livelihood practices in these areas that include, uh, you know, a knowledge and usage of medicinal plants, agriculture, and uh, livestock raising. Uh, the, these types of uh, places in the communities that live in them are important for the lessons they can teach us about resource management and sustainable living and environmental resilience. Uh, but unfortunately, there are currently no national or international uh, agencies working uh, with the communities to link ecology and the communities together to support the, the, the important conservation area. Uh, so we're hoping that the Qardar Nature Reserve will be an excellent field-based example of community-based conservation in Iraq. Um, Qardar's uh, broad range of bioclimatic zones and habitats and uh, you know, rich natural resources and globally significant biodiversity, um, culminating a wide variety of attractions as well uh, for national and international visitors, uh, scientists, um, students, and tourists, um, whoever are interested in um, visiting the area. There are um, year-round um, uh, abundant recreation activities available, um, such as sightseeing and trekking and rock climbing, um, biking, and of course, um, bird watching. Uh, in addition, these, you know, extensive forests in Karadakh are a, a carbon sink of global importance and ensuring the conservation of these forests is of great importance to climate change mitigation efforts and uh, meeting the IG targets in Iraq. The sustainably built eco lodge uh, that was built through the ICN Netherlands Land Acquisition Fund uh, that is located in the heart of the Karadakh Nature Reserve uh, will be used as a research and education uh, center to inform the locals about the environment, conservation and importance of uh, the nature reserve and environment in general, 
uh, with particular attention uh, on the wildlife value and, and the history and local traditions um, by conducting study tours and overnight states and you know creating educational and scientific materials. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the leopard's presence in this area has become a catalyst for creating a peace park uh, between Iraq and Iran, as I mentioned. Uh, the purpose of it was to bring peace between two countries that have been in war together for decades. Um, therefore, our most uh, recent collaborative project uh, with the Future for Leopards Foundation, uh, with a generous um, funding from the Future for Nature, Foundation uh, will do just that, uh, is to estimate the Persian leopard along the border with Iran and advocate for its further protection within the region. Uh, in fact, the dream and the plan of the peace park began in 2016 between Nature Iraq and the Persian Wildlife Heritage Foundation uh, from Iran to reestablish and maintain these important ecosystems. Uh, that surpass uh, man-made borders. Um, unfortunately, um, our collaborators, collaborators from this NGO were imprisoned uh, in January 2018 uh, for claims of espionage. With our initiative to protect the transboundary habitat of the leopard, uh, we're taking a transnational multi-stage approach to conservation to bring the leopard back to a viable population uh, in this region as it once was. Um, and through that, to let the biodiversity of these protected landscapes thrive under the flagship of the leopard. Uh, but none of this would be fruitful without positive collaboration between governments uh, through support of expert um, conservation NGOs and their guidance. Uh, like the Persian Wildlife Heritage Foundation uh, and others in this region. And so I would like to conclude this talk by uh, bringing your attention to this unfortunate case that is also the consequence of the turmoil that this region has faced throughout the years, um, this time directly targeting conservationists. Uh, those of us who know these scientists and worked with them on uh, implementing some important conservation projects uh, know that they had nothing but love for their homeland and we stay hopeful for their safe return to go back to doing what they love the most and that is uh, nature conservation. Um, thank you very much and if you have any questions uh, um, please do so but you can also find me with these handles. Thank you. All right Hannah thank you so much for sharing um that story um i can see that it it, it very often kind of goes from from hard times to times of hope um and you know just a huge uh shout out to you and your team for do, for doing that work and 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 working to protect what it, i mean appears to be just an amazing wealth of biodiversity uh yeah in Iraq. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely absolutely and, and and we're hoping and i hope really that uh you know, more and more people are interested to take um, biodiversity conservation and wildlife conservation uh, as their career in this country, because um, it's very, very difficult for an individual to take a career as difficult as this in a country that is not supportive of uh, the, the field and also because it's very difficult to bring international funds. Uh, so I personally uh, um, am able to bring funds only through international grants and that takes up a lot of time, proposal writing and these things that you all know the nitty gritty details of it. Yeah. Uh, so the government would only be supportive of you uh, if you do not uh, take uh, you know any financial uh, burden on the government. So it's, it's not easy. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And, you know, unfortunately, in the media, you only hear one narrative uh, come out and it's not about conservation. Um, so that's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And that, that's, yeah, yeah. And that's the reason why I want to to present this this talk uh, so that, um, you know, uh, it's not always war. Of course, we always uh, because the, the people who live in this country we always remember the wars that we've been through and it's very difficult to 
to detach ourselves from, from these impacts uh, that we've seen. But we don't want to talk about the war only. We also want to talk about that what you're what you're able to accomplish even under such uh, difficult circumstances. So this is hope for everybody that like. Uh, this is a country that everybody has seen as a ball of fire, but is really not that in reality. No, no, not at all. I mean, those images were beautiful. Um, you know, finding sightings of the leopard and kind of proving that they're still they're still around. I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, having a fish named after you, that's pretty cool too. Um, yeah, it was such an honor. I'm very grateful that uh, Dr. Jörg Freyhoff, who is a German scientist and fish biologist, uh, who came to the country uh, as part of his exploration. Uh, and he found many undiscovered fish species in Kurdistan. And I um, assisted him in during his uh, field work and exploration. And I didn't know that actually, he never told me that he named a fish after me. And I discovered that two years after the fish was named after me. So it's very humbling experience. And these are like very important to, to stay grounded, to do uh, what you love with passion. And uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, you, things that you can you can get in return. So it's not always about the money, as I tell um, you know people in Iraq. It's also about the accomplishments and the, the fruitful results of your hard work as well that pays off. Yeah, I want to squeeze in two more questions uh, before we wrap for today. And one, you know, you showed some people out birding. Uh, there's the eco lodge. Do you think is is tourism and probably more kind of in country tourism? Is it slowly starting? to increase and can that play a role in conservation, generating some funds? Yeah, actually, uh, um, the country in general and Kurdistan mainly is relying on tourism a lot. Unfortunately, it's not ecotourism. Ecotourism is very new to the country. Uh, it's been a very random uh, and disorganized uh, tourism that the, the government is, uh, you know, purpose is to make money out of it, but it's um, um, relatively very easy to come to the country, especially for Europeans and Westerners, Americans, Canadians, there's no problem. Uh, Kurdistan has its own government, so it's independent of Baghdad, of Iraq, so if you come through Kurdistan, oh, there's no problem, um, you know, for visa and everything. So it's a very easy process uh, to come here and it's it's very safe as well. Uh, and it's not like what you see in, in the media. Yep. So I'm curious, you know, the, uh, the youth uh, uh, in in the country, they've obviously lived through, uh, you know, challenging and traumatic times. Is there programs to try and connect them with nature and get them, you know, more excited about it? Maybe mm. conservationists? Mm. Uh, well, with the government, there's uh, not uh, robust plan for rebuilding the country as one wishes, uh, but uh, there are individual efforts and NGOs who are nowadays are increasing, uh, especially the youth who are building um, um, uh, trekking uh, uh, plans and, and hiking groups who are um, building this huge, um, you know, new uh, notion of you know getting back in touch with nature. So I am seeing a lot of that improving, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, ecotourism would also uh, be our next plans, um, especially the government's plans. Um, yeah. Fingers crossed if funding and less turmoil, you know, we're left to breathe a little bit. Okay. Well, Hannah, it was such an honor to host you today. Thank you so much for bringing the story. Uh, to the Global Biodiversity Festival. And thank you for showing us a different side, a different side that we don't really get to see uh, of the country. Um, yeah. And obviously a huge thank you for the work you're doing. Dan, thank you so much, Joe, for having me. It's been a, a pleasure to see such a diverse range of uh, projects across the globe. So what you're doing is amazing as well. And you're giving us a platform to, to tell the story of what's going on through our projects and our experiences. So. Thank you so much. And where should people head if they want to learn more, if they want to dig deeper? Uh, to go to uh, natureiraq.org, uh, Nature Iraq uh, website, and also yep. my social media handles, uh, as I listed them um, previously in my slide. I don't know if my uh, screen is still shared. Again, there we go. Where, yeah, with uh, Hannah Raza. 
uh, you can learn a lot about what we're doing through my social media handle as well. All right, excellent. I'll pop this banner up too. Is that right, natureorock.org? Yes. Perfect, yeah. perfect. Right. Well, again, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing that story. And um, I think we'll definitely be in touch. We're planning on doing mini festivals throughout the year as we, as we build towards year three of the Global Biodiversity Festival. So I think this is a story we need to keep sharing. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.